This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 16, Part 3. This morning, Heinz put it in, of course, the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam were removed from his residence, number 9 Newbridge Avenue, Sandy Mount, for interment in Glasnevin. The deceased gentleman was a most popular and genial personality in city life, and his demise after a brief illness came as a great shock to citizens of all classes, by whom he is deeply regretted. The obsequies at which many friends of the deceased were present, were carried out, certainly Hines wrote it with a nudge from Corney, by Mrs. H. J. O'Neill and Son, 164 North Strand Road. The mourners included Patrick Dignam, son, Bernard Corridon, brother-in-law, Juno Henry Menton, solicitor, Martin Cunningham, John Power, Eton one eighth Ador Dorado Duradora must be where he calls monks the day father about Keyes's ad Thomas Cannon Simon Dedalus Stephen Dedalus B A Edward J. Lambert Cornelius T. Kelleher Joseph McKines L. Boom C. P. McCoy Mackintosh and several others Nettled not a little by L. Boom as incorrectly stated, and the line of bitched type, but tickled to death simultaneously over C. P. McCoy and Stephen Dedalus B. A., who were conspicuous, needless to say, by their total absence, to say nothing of Mackintosh. L. Boom pointed it out to his companion B. A., engaged in stifling another yawn, half nervousness, not forgetting the usual crop of nonsensical howlers of misprints. "'Is that first epistle to the Hebrews?' he asked as soon as his bottom jaw would let him in. "'Text, open thy mouth, and put thy foot in it.' "'It is, really,' Mr. Bloom said, though first he fancied he alluded to the archbishop, till he added about foot and mouth, with which there could be no possible connection. Overjoyed to set his mind at rest, and a bit flabbergasted at Miles Crawford's after all managing to. There. While the other was reading it on page two, Boom, to give him for the nonce his new misnomer, whiled away a few odd leisure moments, in fits and starts, with the account of the third event at Ascot on page three, his side. Value one thousand sovs, with three thousand sovs in specie added, for entire colts and fillies. Mr. F. Alexander's throwaway, B.H. by right away, five years, nine stone, fourteen pounds, W. Lane, one Lord Howard de Walden's Zinfandel, M. Cannon, Z. Mr. Z. Mr. W. Bass's Scepter, three. Betting five to four on Zinfandel, twenty to one throwaway, off. Scepter a shade heavier, five to four on Zinfandel, twenty to one, throw away, off. Throw away and Zinfandel stood close order. It was anybody's race, then the rank outsider drew to the fore, got long lead, beating Lord Howard de Walden's chestnut colt and Mr. W. Bass's bay filly scepter on a two and a half mile course. Winner trained by Brame, so that Lenehan's version of the business was all pure buncombe. Secured the verdict cleverly by a length. One thousand sovs with three thousand in specie. Also ran J. de Bremond's French horse Bantam Lyons was anxiously inquiring after, not in yet, but expected any minute. Maximum two. Different ways of bringing up a coup. Love making damages. Though that half baked Lyons ran off at a tangent in his impetuosity to get left. Of course gambling eminently lent itself to that sort of thing, though as the event turned out, 
The poor fool hadn't much reason to congratulate himself on his pick, the forlorn hope. Guesswork had reduced itself to, eventually. There was every indication they would arrive at that, he, Bloom, said. Who? The other whose hand, by the way, was heard, said. One morning you would open the paper, the cabman affirmed, and read, Return of Parnell. He bet them what they liked. A Dublin fusilier was in that shelter one night and said he saw him in South Africa. Pride it was killed him. He ought to have done away with himself or lain low for a while. After committee room no fifteen until he was his old self again, with no one to point a finger at him. Then they would all to a man have gone down on their marrow bones, to him to come back, when he had recovered his senses. Dead he wasn't. Simply absconded somewhere. The coffin they brought over was full of stones. He changed his name to De Wet, the Boer general. He made a mistake to fight the priests, and so forth and so on. All the same Bloom, properly so dubbed, was rather surprised at their memories, for in nine cases out of ten it was a case of tar-barrels, and not singly but in their thousands, and then complete oblivion because it was twenty-odd years. Highly unlikely, of course, there was even a shadow of truth in the stones, and even supposing, he thought, a return highly inadvisable, all things considered. Something evidently riled them in his death. Either he petered out too tamely of acute pneumonia, just when his various different political arrangements were nearing completion, or whether it transpired he owed his death to his having neglected to change his boots and clothes after a wetting, when a cold resulted in failing to consult a specialist, he being confined to his room till he eventually died of it amid widespread regret, before a fortnight was at an end, or quite possibly they were distressed to find the job was taken out of their hands. Of course nobody being acquainted with his movements, even before there was absolutely no clue as to his whereabouts, which were decidedly of the Alice, where art thou, order, even prior to his starting to go under several aliases such as Fox and Stewart, so the remark which emanated from friend Cabby might be within the bounds of possibility. Naturally, then, it would prey on his mind as a born leader of men, which undoubtedly he was, and a commanding figure, a six-footer or at any rate five feet ten or eleven in his stockinged feet. Whereas Mrs. So-and-so, who though they weren't even a patch for the former man, ruled the roost after their redeeming features were very few and far between. It certainly pointed a moral, the idol with feet of clay, and then seventy-two of his trusty henchmen rounding on him with mutual mudslinging. And the identical same with murderers, you had to come back. That haunting sense kind of drew you, to show the understudy in the, in the title role how to. He saw him once on the auspicious occasion when they broke up the type in the insuppressible, or was it United Ireland, a privilege he keenly appreciated, and, in point of fact, handed him his silk hat when it was knocked off, and he said thank you, excited as he undoubtedly was under his frigid exterior, notwithstanding the little misadventure mentioned between the cup and the lip. What's bred in the bone? Still, as regards return, you were a lucky dog if they didn't set the terrier at you directly you got back. Then a lot of shilly-shally usually followed, Tom Four and Dick and Harry against. And then, number one, you came up against the man in possession and had to produce your credentials like the claimant in the Tichborne case. Roger Charles Tichborne, Bella was the boat's name, to the best of his recollection, he, the heir, went down in as the evidence went to show, and there was a tattoo mark, too, on in, in Indian ink. Lord Bellew, was it, as he might very easily have picked up the details from some pal on board ship, and then, when he got up to tally with the description given, introduced himself with, Excuse me, now my name is so-and-so, or some such common, commonplace remark. A more prudent course, as Bloom said, to the not over-effusive, in fact like the distinguished personage under discussion beside him, 
would have been to sound the lie of the land first. That bitch, that English whore, did for him, the Shebeen proprietor commented. She put the first nail in his coffin. Fine lump of a woman all the same, the soi disant town clerk Henry Campbell remarked, and plenty of her. She loosened many a man's thighs. I've seen her pictures in a barber's. The husband was a captain or an officer. Ay, Skin the Goat amusingly added, he was in a cotton ball one. This gratuitous contribution of a humorous character occasioned a fair amount of laughter among his entourage. As regards Bloom, he, without the faintest suspicion of a smile, merely gazed in the direction of the door, and reflected upon the historic story which had aroused extraordinary interest at the time when the facts, to make matters worse, were made public with the usual affectionate letters that passed between them full of sweet nothings. First it was strictly platonic, till nature intervened, and an attachment sprang up between them, till bit by bit matters came to a climax, and the matter became the talk of the town till the staggering blow came as a welcome intelligence to not a few evil disposed, however, who were resolved upon encompassing his downfall, though the thing was public property all along, though not to anything like the sensational extent that it subsequently blossomed into. Since their names were coupled, though, since he was her declared favourite, where was the particular necessity to to proclaim it to the rank and file from the housetops, the fact, namely, that he had shared her bedroom, which came out at, in the witness-box on oath, when a thrill went through the packed court, literally electrifying everybody in the shape of witnesses, swearing to having witnessed him on such and such a particular date, in the act of scrambling out of an upstairs apartment, with the assistance of a ladder in night apparel, having gained admittance in the same fashion, a fact the weeklies, addicted to the lubric a little, simply coin shoals of money out of. Whereas the simple fact of the case was, it was simply a case of the husband not being up to the scratch, which nothing in common between them beyond the name, and then a real man arriving on the scene, strong to the verge of weakness, falling a victim to her siren charms, and forgetting home ties, the usual sequel, to bask in the loved one's smiles. The eternal question of the life connubial, needless to say, cropped up. Can real love, supposing there happens to be another chap in the case, exist between married folk? Poser! Though it was not no concern of theirs, absolutely, if he regarded her with affection, carried away by a wave of folly. A magnificent specimen of manhood, he was truly augmented, obviously, by gifts of a high order, as compared with the other military supernumerary, that is, who was just the usual everyday farewell, my gallant captain kind of an individual, in the light dragoons, the eighteenth hussars, to be accurate, and inflammable doubtless, the fallen leader, that is, not the other, in his own peculiar way, which she, of course, woman, quickly perceived as highly likely to carve his way to fame, which he almost bid fair to do, till the priests and ministers of the gospel as a whole, his erstwhile staunch adherents, and his beloved evicted tenants, for whom he had done yeoman service in the rural parts of the country, by taking up the cudgels on their behalf, in a way that exceeded most their most sanguine expectations, very effectually cooked his matrimonial goose, thereby heaping coals of fire on his head, much in the same way as the fabled ass's kick. Looking back now, in a retrospective kind of arrangement, all seemed a kind of dream. And then coming back was the worst thing you ever did, because it went without saying you would feel out of place as things moved away, move, always moved with the times. Why, as he reflected, Irish Town Strand, a locality had not been in for quite a number of years, looked different somehow since, as it happened, he went to reside on the north side. North or south, however, it was just the well-known case of hot passion, pure and simple. 
upsetting the apple cart with a vengeance, and just bore out the very thing he was saying as she also was Spanish, or half so, types that wouldn't do things by halves, passionate abandon of the South, casting every shred of decency to the winds. Just bears out what I was saying, he with glowing bosom said to Stephen, about blood and the sun, and if I don't greatly mistake, she was Spanish too. The king of Spain's daughter, Stephen answered, adding something or other rather muddled about farewell and adieu to you Spanish onions, and the first land called the dead man and the ramhead to Silly was so and so many. Was she? Bloom ejaculated, surprised, though not astonished by any means, if never heard that rumour before. Possibly, especially there, it was as she lived there. So, Spain. Carefully avoiding a book in his pocket sweets, of which reminded him, by the by, of that cap one street library book out of date, he took out his pocket book and, turning over the various contents, it contained rapidly finally he. Do you consider, by the way, he said, thoughtfully selecting a faded photo which he laid on the table, that a Spanish type? Stephen, obviously addressed, looking down on the photo showing a large-sized lady with her fleshy charms on evidence in an open fashion, as she was in the full bloom of womanhood, an evening dress cut ostentatiously low for the occasion, to give a liberal display of bosom, with more than vision of breasts, her full lips parted and some perfect teeth standing near, ostensibly with, gra with gravity, a piano on the rest of which was an old Madrid, a ballad pretty in its way, which was then all the vogue. Her, the lady's, eyes, dark, large, looked at Stephen, about to smile about something to be admired. Lafayette of Westmoreland Street, Dublin's premier photographic artist, being responsible for the aesthetic execution. Mrs. Bloom, my wife, the prima donna, Madame Marion Tweedy, Bloom indicated, taken a few years since, in or about ninety-six, very like her then. Beside the young man he looked also at the photo of the lady now, his legal wife, who, he intimated, was the accomplished daughter of Major Brian Tweedy, and displayed at an early age remarkable proficiency as a singer, having even made her bow to the public, when her years numbered barely sweet sixteen. As for the face, it was a speaking likeness in expression, but it did not do justice to her figure, which came in for a lot of notice usually, and which did not come out to the best advantage in that get-up. She could, without difficulty, he said, have posed for the ensemble, not to dwell on certain opulent curves of the... He dwelt, being a bit of an artist in his spare time, on the female form in general developmentally, because, as it so happened, no later than the afternoon he had seen those Grecian statues, perfectly developed as works of art, in the National Museum. Marble could give the original, shoulders back, all the symmetry, all the rest. Yes, puritanisme. It does, though, St. Joseph's sovereign thievery a law, bandé. Fine toi trop whereas no photo could, because it simply wasn't art, in a word. The spirit moving him, he would have much liked to follow Jack Tarr's good example, and leave the likeness there for a few minutes, to speak for itself on the plea, he, so that the other could drink in the beauty for himself, her stage presence being, frankly, a treat in itself which the camera could not at all do justice to. But it was scarcely professional etiquette so. Though it was a warm, pleasant sort of a night, now yet wonderfully cool for the season considering, for sunshine after storm. And he did feel a kind of need there and then to follow suit, like a kind of inward voice, and satisfy a possible need by moving emotion. Nevertheless he sat tight, 
viewing the slightly soiled photo, creased by opulent curves, none the worse for wear, however, and looked away thoughtfully with the intention of not further increasing the other's possible embarrassment while gauging her symmetry of heaving ambon point. In fact, the slight soiling was only an added charm, like the case of linen slightly soiled, good as new, much better, in fact, with a starch out. Suppose she was gone when he... I looked for a lamp, which she told me came into his mind, but merely as a passing fancy of his, because he then recollected the morning littered bed, etc., and the book about Ruby, which met him, Pike Horses, sick, in which must have fell down sufficiently appropriately beside the domestic chamber pot, with apologies to Lindley Murray. The vicinity of the young man he certainly relished, educated, distingué, and impulsive into the bargain, far and away the pick of the bunch, so he wouldn't think he had it in him, yet he would. Besides, he said, the picture was handsome, which, say what you like, it was though at the moment she was distinctly stouter. And why not? An awful lot of make-believe went on about that sort of thing, involving a lifelong slur, with the usual splash page of gutter-press about the same old matrimonial tangle, alleging misconduct with professional golfer or the newest stage favourite, instead of being honest and above board about all the, about the whole business. How they were fated to meet, and an attachment sprang up between the two, so that their names were coupled in the public eye, was told in court with letters containing the habitual mushy and compromising expressions, leaving no loophole to show that they openly cohabitated two or three times a week at some well-known seaside hotel, and relations, when the thing ran its normal course, became in due course intimate. Then the decree Nisi, and the king's proctor tries to show course, why, and he failing to, to quash it, Nisi was made absolute. But as for that, the two misdemeanants, wrapped up as they largely were in one another, could safely afford to ignore it, as they very largely did, till the matter was put in the hands of a solicitor, who filed a petition for the party wronged in due course. He, B, enjoyed the distinction of being close to Erin's uncrowned king in the flesh, when the thing occurred in the historic fracas, when the falling leaders, who notoriously stuck out his guns, to the last drop even when clothed in the mantle of adultery, leaders, trusty henchmen, to the number of ten or a dozen or possibly even more, than that penetrated into the printing works of the insuppressible, or no, it was United Ireland, a by no means by the by appropriate appellative, and broke up the typecases with hammers or something like that, all on account of some scurrilous effusions from the facile pens of the O'Brienite scribes at the usual mudslinging occupation, reflecting on the erstwhile tribune's private morals. Though palpably a radically altered man, he was still a commanding figure, though carelessly garbed, as usual, with that look of settled purpose, which went a long way into the shilly shallyers till they discovered, to their vast discomfiture, that their idol had feet of clay after placing him upon a pedestal, which she, however, was the first to perceive. As those were particularly hot times in the general hullabaloo, Bloom sustained a minor injury from a nasty prod of some chap's elbow in the crowd, that of course congregated, lodging some place about the pit of the stomach, fortunately not of a grave character. His hat, Parnell's, a silk one, was inadvertently knocked off, and, as a matter of strict history, Bloom was the man who picked it up in the crush after witnessing the occurrence meaning to return it to him, and return it to him he did with the utmost celerity, who, panting and hatless, and whose thoughts were miles away from his hat at the time, all the same being a gentleman born with a stake in the country, he, as a matter of fact, having gone into it more for the kudos of the thing than anything else, what's bred in the bone instilled into him 
in infancy at his mother's knee in the shape of knowing what good form was come out at once, because he turned round to the donor and thanked him with perfect aplomb, saying, "'Thank you, sir,' though in a very different tone of voice from the ornament of the legal profession, whose headgear Bloom also set to rights earlier in the course of the day, history repeating itself with a difference. After the burial of a mutual friend, when they had left him alone in his glory, after the grim task of having committed his remains to the grave. On the other hand, what incensed him more inwardly was the blatant jokes of the cabman, and so on, who passed it all off as a jest, laughing immoderately, pretending to understand everything, the why and the wherefore, and in reality not knowing their own minds, it being a case for the two parties themselves, unless it ensued that the legitimate husband happened to be a party to it, owing to some anonymous letter from the usual boy Jones, who happened to come across them at the crucial moment in a loving position, locked in one another's arms, drawing attention to their illicit proceedings and leading up to a domestic rumpus, and the erring fair one begging forgiveness of her lord and master upon her knees, and promising to sever the connection, and not receive his visits any more, if only the aggrieved husband would overlook the matter, and let bygones be bygones, with tears in her eyes, though possibly with her tongue and her fair cheek at the same time, as quite possibly there were several others. He personally, being of a sceptical bias, believed, and didn't make the smallest bones about saying so, either that man or men, in the plural, were always hanging around on the waiting list about a lady, even supposing she was the best wife in the world, and they got on fairly well together for the sake of argument, when, neglecting her duties, she chose to be tired of wedded life, and was on for a little flutter in polite debauchery, to press their attentions on her with improper intent, the upshot being that her affections centred on another. The cause of many liaisons between still attractive married women getting on for fair and forty, and younger men, no doubt as several famous cases of feminine infatuation, proved up to the hilt. It was a thousand pities a young fellow, blessed with an allowance of brains, as his neighbour obviously was, should waste his valuable time with profligate women who might present him with a nice dose to last him his lifetime. In the nature of single blessedness, he would one day take unto himself a wife when Miss Wright came on the scene, but in the interim ladies' society was a conditio sine qua non, though he had the gravest possible doubts that he not that he wanted in the smallest to pump Stephen about Miss Ferguson, who was very possibly the particular lodestar who brought him down to Irish Town so early in the morning. As to whether he would find much satisfaction basking in the boy and girl courtship idea, and the company of smirking misses, without a penny to their names, by or tri-weekly, with the orthodox preliminary canter of compliment playing, and walking out leading up to fond lover's way and flowers and trocks. To think of him, house and homeless, rooked by some landlady worse than any stepmother, was really too bad at his age. The queer suddenly things he popped out with attracted the elder man, who was several years the other's senior, or like his father, but something substantial he certainly ought to eat, even were it only an egg-flip, made on unadulterated maternal nutriment, or, failing that, the homely Humpty Dumpty boiled. "'And what o'clock did you dine?' he questioned of the slim form and tired, though unwrinkled, face. "'Sometime yesterday,' Stephen said. "'Yesterday!' exclaimed Bloom, till he remembered it was already to-morrow Friday. "'Ah, you mean it's after twelve? "'The day before yesterday.' Stephen said, improving on himself. Literally astounded at this piece of intelligence, Bloom reflected. Though they didn't see eye to eye in everything, a certain analogy there somehow was, as if both their minds were travelling, so to speak, in the one train of thought. 
At his age, when dabbling in politics roughly some score of years previously, when he had been a quasi-aspirant to parliamentary honours, in the buckshot foster days, he too recollected in retrospect, which was a source of keen satisfaction in itself. He had a sneaking regard for those same ultra-ideas. For instance, when the evicted tenants question, then at its first inception, bulked largely in people's minds, though, it goes without saying, not contributing a copper or pinning his faith absolutely to its dictums, some of which wouldn't exactly hold water, he, at the outset, at all events, was in thorough sympathy with peasant possession as voicing the trend of modern opinion, a partiality, however, which, realising his mistake, he was subsequently partially cured of, and even was twitted with going a step farther than Michael David in the striking views he at one time inculcated as a back to the lander, which was one reason he strongly resented the innuendo put upon him in so barefaced a fashion by our friend at the gathering of the clans in Barney Kiernan's, so that he, though often considerably misunderstood, and the least pugnacious of mortals, be it repeated, departed from his customary habit to give him, metaphorically, one in the gizzard, though, as far as politics themselves were concerned, he was only too conscious of the mutual animosity and the misery and suffering it entailed, as a foregone conclusion of fine young fellows, chiefly destruction of the fittest, in a word. Anyhow, upon weighing up the pros and cons, getting on for one as it was, it was high time to be retiring for the night. The crux was it was a bit risky to bring him home, as eventualities might possibly ensue, somebody having a temper of her own sometimes, and spoil the hash altogether, as on the night he misguidedly brought home a dog, breed unknown, with a lame paw. Not that the cases were either identical or the reverse, though he had hurt his hand too. To Ontario Terrace, as he very distinctly remembered having been there, so to speak. On the other hand, it was altogether far and away too late for the Sandy Mount or Sandy Cove suggestion, so that he was in some perplexity as to which of the two alternatives. Everything pointed to the fact that it behoved him to avail himself to the full of the opportunity, all things considered. His initial impression was he was a shade standoffish or not over-effusive, but it grew on him some way. For one thing he mightn't what he called jump at the idea, if approached, and what mostly worried him was he didn't know how to lead up to it, or word it exactly supposing he did entertain the proposal, as it would afford him very great personal pleasure if he would allow him to help out, to help to put coin in his way, or some wardrobe, if found suitable. At all events, he wound up by concluding, as giving for the nonce high-bound precedent, a cup of Epps cocoa and a shakedown for the night, plus the use of a rug or two, and overcoat doubled into a pillow, at least he would be in safe hands, and as warm as a toast on a trivet, if he failed to perceive any very vast amount of harm in that always, with a proviso no rumpus of any sort was kicked up. A move had to be made, because that merry old soul, the grass widower in question, who appeared to be glued to the spot, didn't appear in any particular hurry to wend his way home to the dearly beloved Queenstown and it was highly likely some sponge's bawdy house of retired beauties, where age was no bar off Sheriff Street lower, would be the best clue to that equivocal character's whereabouts for a few days to come, alternately racking their feelings, the mermaids, with six-chamber revolver and anecdotes verging on the tropical, calculated to freeze the marrow of anybody's bones and mauling their large-sized charms between whiles with rough and tumble gusto to the accompaniment of large potations of potine and the usual blarney about himself as to who he in reality was let x equal my right name and address as mr algebra remarks pass him at the same time he inwardly chuckled over his gentle repartee to the 
blood and ounds champion about his god being a Jew. People could put up with being bitten by a wolf, but what properly riled them was a bite from a sheep. The most vulnerable point, too, of tender Achilles. Your god was a Jew, because mostly they appeared to imagine he came from Carrick-on-Shannon, or somewhereabouts in the county Sligo. I propose, our hero eventually suggested, after mature reflection, while prudently pocketing her photo, as it's rather stuffy here, you just come home with me and talk things over. My diggings are quite close in the vicinity. You can't drink that stuff. Do you like cocoa? Wait, I'll just pay this lot. The best plan clearly being to clear out, the remainder being plain sailing, he beckoned, while prudently pocketing the photo, to the keeper of the shanty who didn't seem to. Yes, that's the best, he assured Stephen, to whom, for the matter of that brazen head or him or anywhere else, was all more or less. All kinds of utopian plans were flashing through his, B's, busy brain. In education, the genuine article, literature, journalism, prize tidbits, up-to-date billing, concert tours in English watering resorts packed with hydros and seaside theatres, turning money away, duets in Italian, with the accent perfectly true to nature, and a quantity of other things, no necessity, of course, to tell the world and, the, and his wife from the housetops about it, and a slice of luck. An opening was all was wanted. Because he more than suspected he had his father's voice to bank his hopes on, which it was quite on the cards he had, so it would be just as well, by the way, no harm, to trail the conversation in the direction of that particular red herring just too. The cabby read out of the paper he had got hold of that the former viceroy, Earl Cadogan, had presided at the cab driver's association dinner in London somewhere. Silence with a yawn or two accompanied this thrilling announcement. Then the old specimen in the corner, who appeared to have some spark of vitality left, read out that Sir Anthony MacDonald had left Euston for the chief secretary's lodge or words to that effect. To which absorbing piece of intelligence Echo answered why? Give us a squint at that literature, Grandfather, the ancient mariner put in, manifesting some natural impatience. And welcome, answered the elderly party thus addressed. The sailor lugged out from a case he had a pair of greenish goggles, which he very slowly hooked over his nose and both ears. "'Are you bad in the eyes?' the sympathetic personage, like the town clerk, queried. "'Why?' answered the seafarer with a tartan beard, who seemingly was a bit of a literary cove in his own small way, staring out of sea-green potholes, as you might well describe them as. "'I use as goggles reading.' "'Sand in the Red Sea done that.' "'One time I could read a book in the dark, manner of speaking.' The Arabian Nights Entertainment was my favourite, and red as a rose is she. Hereupon he poured the journal open, and poured upon Lord only knows what, found drowned, or the exploits of King Willow, Ironmonger, having made a hundred and something second wicket not out for knots, during which time, completely regardless of ire, the keeper was intensely occupied, loosening an apparently new or second-hand boot, which manifestly pinched him as he muttered against whoever it was sold it, all of them who were sufficiently awake enough to be picked out by their facial expressions, that is to say, either simply going on glumly or passing a trivial, a trivial remark. To cut a long story short, Bloom, grasping the situation, was the first to rise from his seat, so as not to outstay their welcome, having first and foremost, being as good as his word, that he would foot the bill for the occasion, taking the wise precaution to unobtrusively motion to mine host, as a parting shot a scarcely perceptible sign, when the others were not looking, to the effect that the amount due was forthcoming. 
making a grand total of fourpence, the amount he deposited unobtrusively in four coppers, literally the last of the Mohicans. He having previously spotted on the printed price list for all who ran to read opposite him in unmistakable figures, coffee two d, confectionery do, and honestly well worth twice the money once and away, as Weatherup used to remark. Come, he counselled to close the séance. Seeing that the ruse worked and the coast was clear, they left the shelter or shanty together and the elite society of oilskin and company whom nothing short of an earthquake would move out of their dolce far niente. Stephen, who confessed to still feeling poorly and fagged out, paused at the, for a moment, the door. "'One thing I never understand,' he said, to be original on the spur of the moment. "'Why they put tables upside down at night?' I mean chairs upside down, on the tables and cafés. To which impromptu the never-failing Bloom replied, without a moment's hesitation, saying straight off, to sweep the floor in the morning. So saying, he skipped around, nimbly considering, frankly at the same time apologetic, to get on his companion's right, a habit of his, by the by, his right side being, on in classical idiom, his tender Achilles. The night air was certainly now a treat to breathe, though Stephen was a bit weak on his pins. "'It will, the air, do you good,' Bloom said, meaning also the walk, in a moment. "'The only thing is to walk, then you'll feel a different man. Come, it's not far. Lean on me.' Accordingly he passed his left arm in Stephen's right, and led him on accordingly. "'Yes,' Stephen said uncertainly, because he thought he felt a strange kind of flesh of a different man approach him, sinewless and wobbly and all that. Anyhow, they passed the sentry-box with stones, brazier, etc., where the municipal supernumerary, ex Gumley, was still to all intents and purposes wrapped in the arms of Murphy, at the adage has it, dreaming of fresh fields and pastures new. And apropos of coffin, of stones, the analogy was not at all bad, as it was in fact a stoning to death on the part of seventy-two out of eighty-odd constituencies that ratted at the time of the split, and chiefly the belauded peasant class, probably the self-same evicted tenants he had put in their holdings. So they turned on to chatting about music a form of art for which Bloom, as a pure amateur, possessed the greatest love, as they made tracks arm in arm across Beresford Place. Wagnerian music, though confessedly grand in its way, was a bit too heavy for Bloom, and hard to follow at the first go-off, but the music of Mercadante's Huguenots, Meyerbeer's Seven Last Words, or the cross and Mozart's twelfth mass he simply revelled in. The Gloria in that being, to his mind, the acme of first-class music as such, literally knocking everything else into a cocked hat. He infinitely preferred the sacred music of the Catholic Church to anything the opposite shop could offer in that line, such as those moody and sankey hymns, or bid me to live, and I will live thy Protestant to be. He also yielded to none in his admiration of Rossini's Stabat Mater, a work simply abounding in immortal numbers, in which his wife, Madame Marion Tweedy, made a hit, a veritable sensation, he might safely say, greatly adding to her other laurels, and putting the others totally in the shade, in the Jesuit Father's Church in Upper Gardener Street, the sacred er edifice being thronged to the door, to hear her with virtuosos, a virtuosi, rather. There was the unanimous opinion that there was none to come up to her, and suffice it to say, in a place of worship for music of a sacred character, there was a generally voiced desire for an encore. On the whole, though favouring preferably light opera of the Don Giovanni description, and Martha, a gem in its line, 
he had a penchant, though with only a surface knowledge, for the severe classical school such as Mendelssohn. And talking of that, taking it for granted, he knew all about the old favourites. He mentioned par excellence, Lionel's heir and Martha, Mapari, which, curiously enough, he had heard, or overheard, to be more accurate, on yesterday, a privilege he keenly appreciated, from the lips of Stephen's respected father, sung to perfection, a study of the number, in fact, which made all the others take a back seat. Stephen, in reply to a politely put query, said he didn't sing it, but launched out into praises of Shakespeare's songs, at least of, in or about that period, the lutinist Dowland, who lived in Fetter Lane near Gerard, the herbalist, whose Anuludendu Hausi, Dulandus, an instrument he was con contemplating purchasing from Mr. Ar Arnold Dolmetsch, whom B. did not quite recall, though the name certainly sounded familiar, for sixty-five guineas, and Farnaby and Son with their ducks and combs, conceits, and Bird, William, who played the virginals, he said, in the Queen's Chapel, or anywhere else he found them, and one Tomkins, who made toys or airs, and John Bull. On the roadway which they were approaching, whilst still speaking beyond the swing-chains, a horse, dragging a sweeper, paced on the paven ground, brushing long swathes of mire, up so that, with a noise, Bloom was not perfectly certain whether he had caught aright the allusion to sixty-five guineas and John Bull. He inquired if it was John Bull, the political celebrity of that ilk, as it struck him the two identical names as a striking coincidence. By the chains the horse slowly swerved to turn, which, perceiving Bloom, who was keeping a sharp lookout as usual, plucked the other's, sle the other's sleeve gently, jocosely remarking, "'Our lives are in peril to-night. Beware of the steam-roller.' They thereupon stopped. Bloom looked at the head of a horse not worth anything like sixty-five guineas, suddenly in evidence in the dark, quite near, so that it seemed new, a different grouping of bones and even flesh, because palpably it was a forewalker, a hip-shaker, a black buttocker, a tail-dangler, a head-hanger, putting his hind foot foremost, the while the lord of his creation sat on the perch, busy with his thoughts. But such a good poor brute, he was sorry he hadn't a lump of sugar, but, as he wisely reflected, he could scarcely be prepared for every emergency that might crop up. He was just a bit ner big, nervous, foolish, noodly kind of a horse, without a second care in the world. But even a dog, he reflected, take that mongrel of Barney Kiernan's, of the same size, would be a holy horror to face. But it was no animal's fault in particular, if he was built that way, like the camel, ship of the desert, distilling grapes into potheen in his hump. Nine-tenths of them all could be caged or trained, nothing beyond the art of man barring the bees. Whale with a harpoon hairpin, alligator tickled the small of his back, and he sees the joke. Chalk a circle for a rooster, tiger my eagle eye. These timely reflections, and then to the brutes of the field, occupied his mind, somewhat distracted from Stephen's words, while the ship of the street was manoeuvring, and Stephen went on about the highly interesting old. What's this I was saying? Ah, yes, my wife, he intimated, plunging in medias rays, would have the greatest of pleasure in making your acquaintance, as she is passionately attached to music of any kind. He looked sideways in a friendly fashion at the side face of Stephen, image of his mother, which was not quite the same as the usual handsome blackguard type they unquestionably had an insatiable hankering after, as he was perhaps not that way built. Still, supposing he had his father's gift, as he, 
more than suspected, it opened up new vistas in his mind, such as Lady Fingal's Irish Industries, concert on the preceding Monday, and aristocracy in general. Exquisite variations he was now describing on an air Youth Here Has End by Jans Peter Swielink, a Dutchman of Amsterdam, where the Fraus came from. Even more he liked an old German song of Johannes Jeep about the clear sea and the voices of sirens, sweet murderers of men, which boggled Bloom a bit. Von der Sirenen Listigkeit tun die Poeten dichten. These opening bars he sang and translated extempore. Bloom, nodding, said he perfectly understood and begged him to go on by all means, which he did. A phenomenally beautiful tenor voice like that, the rarest of boons, which Bloom appreciated at the first note he got out, could easily, if properly handled by some recognized authority in voice production, such as Baraclough, and being able to read music into the bargain, command its own price, where baritones were ten a penny, and procure for its fortunate possessor, in the near future, an entree into fashionable houses in the best residential quarters of financial magnates, in the large way of business and titled people, where, with his university degree of B.A., a huge ad in its way, and gentlemanly bearing to all the more influence, the good impression he would infallibly score a distinct success, being blessed with brains, which also could be utilized for the purpose and other requisites, if his clothes were properly attended to, so as to the better worm his way into their good graces, as he, a youthful tyro in society's sartorial niceties, hardly understood how a little thing like that could militate against you. It was in fact only a matter of months, and he could easily foresee him participating in their musical and artistic conversaciones during the festiv festivities of the Christmas season, for choice, causing a slight flutter in the dovecotes of the fair sex, and being made a lot of by the ladies out for sensation, cases of which, as he happened to know, were on record. In fact, Without giving the show away, he himself, once upon a time, if he cared to, could easily have. Added to which, of course, would be the pecuniary emolument, by no means to be sneezed at, going hand in hand with his tuition fees. Not, he parenthesized, that for the sake of filthy lucre he need necessarily embrace the lyric platform as a walk in life for any lengthy space of time but a step in the required direction, it was beyond yea or nay, and both monetarily and mentally it contained no reflection on his dignity in the smallest, and it often turned in uncommonly handy to be handed a cheque at a much-needed moment when every little helped. Besides, though taste latterly had deteriorated to a degree, original music like that, different from the conventional rut, would rapidly have a great vogue, as it would be decided novelty for Dublin's musical world, after the usual hackneyed run of catchy tenor solos, foisted on a confiding public by Ivan St. Austell and Hilton St. Just and their genus omne. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could, with all the cards in his hand, and he had a capital opening to make a name for himself and win a high place in the city's esteem, where he could command a stiff figure, and, booking ahead, giving a grand concert for the patrons of the King Street house, given a backer-up, if one were forthcoming to kick him upstairs, so to speak, a big if, however, with some impetus of the goat-head sort, to obviate the inevitable procrastination which often tripped up a too-much-fated prince of good fellows." and it need not detract from the other by one iota, as, being his own master, he would have heaps of time to practice literature in his spare moments, when desirous of so doing, without its clashing with a vocal career, or containing anything derogatory whatsoever, as it was a matter for himself alone. 
In fact, he had the ball at his feet, and was the very reason why the other, possessed of a remarkably sharp nose, for smelling a rat of any sort, hung on to him at all. The horse was just then, and later on, at a propitious opportunity, he purposed, Bloom did, without any way prying into his private affairs, on the fool's step in where Angel's principal, advising him to sever his connection with a certain budding practitioner, who, he noticed, was prone to disparage, and even to a slight extent, with some hilarious pretext when not present, deprecate him, or whatever you like to call it, in which Bloom's humble opinion threw a nasty sidelight on that side of a person's character, no pun intended. The horse, having reached the end of his tether, so to speak, halted, and rearing high a proud feathering tail, added his quota by letting fall on the floor, which the brush would soon brush up and polish, three smoking globes of turds. Slowly three times, one after another, from a full crupper he mired, and humanely his driver waited till he or she had ended, patient in his scythed car. Side by side, Bloom, profiting by the contretemps, with Stephen passed through the gap of the chains, divided by the upright, and stepping over a strand of mire, went across towards Gardiner Street Lower, Stephen singing more boldly, but not loudly, the end of the ballad. Und alle Schiffe brücken. The driver never said a word, good, bad, or indifferent, but merely watched the two figures, as he sat on his low-backed car, both black, one full, one lean, walked towards the railway bridge, to be married by Father Meha. As they walked, they at times stopped and walked again, continuing their tete-a-tete, -tete, which, of course, he was utterly out of, about sirens, enemies of man's reason, mingled with a number of other topics of the same category usurpers, historical cases of the kind, while the man in the sleeper-car, or you might as well call it, who in any case couldn't possibly hear, because they were too far, simply sat in his seat, near the end of Lower Gardener Street, and looked after their low-backed car. End of section 16, part 3 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June 2006